Welcome everyone to this IES webinar, Managing Change and the Economics of a Clean Transition. This webinar has been organized as part of the IES's Future of Environmental Science 2023 Horizon Scanning and Foresight Project, which you can find out more about on our website. We're delighted today to be joined by Dimitri Zangelis. Dimitri is a special advisor to the Bennett Institute at the University of Cambridge and a senior visiting fellow at the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics. He headed the Stern Review team at the Office of Climate Change London and was a lead author on the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change. As ever, after Dimitri's presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. So please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation. Um, and I'll then read these out later on during the Q&A. This webinar is also being recorded and will be made available on the IES YouTube channel. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, I'll hand over to you, Dimitri. Thank you. Ethne, thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Dimitri Zengelis. Uh, I'm an economist. Uh, I was one of the lead authors, uh, lead authors on the uh, economics of climate change uh, study or, um, commissioned by the government almost a decade ago, known as the Stern Review, uh, which was led by uh, Lord Stern. And I've worked uh, on this issue ever since, but um, uh, always with a macroeconomic framing, because uh, prior to that, I was a, a, a macroeconomist uh, in government, um, heading economic forecasting at the Treasury. So um, what I'm going to talk about is less about the science and more about the economics of transition, which I hope is complementary to the audience's skills out there, because uh, you guys uh, are very much more deeply involved in the scientific part of this story. Uh, and again, um, I'm also going to, there's a lot of economics to do with climate uh, risks and impacts and ad adapting to climate change. I'm going to focus less on that and I'm going to talk about the economic transition and how the global economy is likely to change in the face of our response to some of the existential risks associated with climate change. And I'm going to argue um, that those risks are not only quite large insofar as we're going to see quite a uh, a, a, a you know, systematic structural transformation in, in our economy, but that we may be caught out by surprise, continue to be caught by surprise uh, in terms of the size of that adjustment, and that therefore it's very risky to fall behind in terms of understanding the way the economy is going. Those that aren't on top of uh, the transition face the risk of stranded and devalued assets and will be in a much worse position um, to take advantage of the opportunities associated with uh, decarbonization. And I'll finish by saying that this means that, you know, trying to forecast the future, which is something that economists spend a lot of time doing, is a rather foolhardy aim, when in fact, uh, securing that future is very much in the hands of uh, leaders uh, in business, in civil society, and perhaps especially in policy. So that's, in a sense, what I'm going to say. Uh, and I'm going to start by giving a little bit of a sort of explanation of net zero. This is I, I trawled the Internet for a nice uh, representation of net zero. Uh, and this is uh, the best that I could come up with. Um, now, people, um, I will often start my presentations by telling people that it's not a case of, uh, of whether we're going to net, get to net zero. It's about when and how. In other words, we will transition our economy to net zero. Now, as scientists, I suspect most of you understand why. Uh, the simple reason in terms of climate science is that it is the stock of greenhouse gases, not the annual emissions, not the stuff that's correlated with annual economic activity, things like GDP or consumption, but it's the stock. Uh, these greenhouse gases, they stick around in the atmosphere for tens, maybe hundreds of years, depending on the gas. Uh, and it is that stock that correlates to uh, average mean global temperature increases, which are what drive the key climate risks. Now, this is important because as with any stock flow mechanism, uh, it means that if you're going to stabilize the stock and therefore stabilize the temperature, you have to bring uh, emissions and your flows down to uh, zero or to net zero. Don't worry too much about the net term. Um, you know, uh, consider it, it's a set to all intents and purposes, we're talking about zero, we're talking about the Earth's natural capacity to absorb uh, greenhouse gas emissions in any one year, close to zero. Um, 
If we don't, the stock of greenhouse gases will just keep going up and up and up and up. So it doesn't matter whether you're planning to stabilize at, uh, you know, one and a half degrees or two degrees or three degrees or god awful, you know, five degrees or hell in a handbasket degrees. Any stabilization temperature requires getting to net zero. And we will either do this the easy way by managing that transition uh, effectively, or we'll do it the hard way by letting nature create such a hostile climate that we start depopulating and deindustrializing the planet and we bring emissions down that way. But one thing we can be sure about is that temperatures are not going to just inexorably rise forever. We will get to net zero, in other words. Now, of course, that's a challenge, right? Because it means we have to transition an economy that looks very much like this, based on fossil fuels, uh, and based on uh, burning a lot of stuff for our energy uh, into something um, that is almost entirely devoid of these kinds of um, processes. Um, we've got about 700 or so gigatons of CO2 left in our budget if we're to meet the two degree target, um, less than half of that if we're going to meet one and a half degrees. Um, and um, the earth is still um, full of at least uh, five or six times that level of fossil fuel uh, resources and reserves, stuff that's readily accessible uh, in the ground that can be burnt and that very often is in the books of fossil fuel companies in terms of their asset valuation. That stuff, most of it, is going to have to either stay in the ground or if we uh, burn it, we're going to have to capture it. To give you an idea of what this means, at least a third of global oil reserves, half of the world's gas reserves, and almost all the world's uh, coal reserves will have to either not be used uh, or any emissions will have to be captured. And it doesn't stop there. Uh, there's a lot of downstream uh, infrastructure in transport, refineries, power generation, and of course, all the financial services that are heavily invested in fossil fuel entangled countries around the world that will be affected, uh, companies and countries, uh, that will be affected by this transition. So it's going to touch everybody. Um, and so it's a fair question that economists are asked, is, you know, what is this going to cost to make this massive transition? Um, the World Bank estimates it's going to involve at least 100 trillion in assets. So it's a big number. But we need to be very careful how we interpret this issue of cost. And a lot of what I'm going to say in this presentation uh, warns against an overestimation of what we actually mean uh, by cost and an underestimation of a lot of the benefits of the uh, transition. Well, there is some good news um, to this story. Um, you know, you're probably familiar with these charts. They just show uh, effectively that um, key costs in uh, key uh, renewable technologies have been coming down very, very quickly. Um, the left chart is solar PV, the right is uh, wind. These are both now very comfortably uh, compatible with fossil fuel technologies in terms of costs, even if you start including the systems cost associated with storage and so on. The good news, um, well, first of all, you know, it's worth noting you know, the rate of this decline, the cost of solar PV has fallen by about 90% over the last decade, not nine, 90. Wind and more mature technology costs have fallen by maybe 40% or so, um, also more capital intensive as well. But the really good news, is that the you know the wind doesn't always blow the sun doesn't always shine you're going to need some form of storage um in addition to conventional storage like pump storage increasingly we're seeing the use of uh battery storage lithium-ion battery costs have also fallen by about 80 percent over this period they continue to fall uh, and increasingly we're seeing rapid falls in the cost of hydrogen which is a form of uh, liquid storage that can be brought into play as well. We're also seeing other um, improvements in the way we manage demand and demand responsiveness and also systems integration uh, using interconnectors that allow us to cut the costs of, uh, 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 of intermittency quite substantially. Indeed, to the extent that these costs are yet to begin to bite, even in countries which have 50% uh, plus penetration of renewables. So this is really quite important. Um, we're getting whole new sectors that are, are being developed. Um, those countries, that, to some extent, lead in uh, having investing in those capabilities in the networks, in the production clusters, are also uh, seeing some competitiveness uh, gain. And there are several studies that show the extent to which um, that is happening. So you know, with that in mind, it's perhaps not surprising to hear that uh, investment in electricity generation the world over has pretty much over the last decade been uh, uh, renewables. Base, pretty much three quarters, even if you exclude hydrogen and uh, nuclear, uh, uh, pretty much three quarters of annual investment has been two thirds to three quarters uh, in the form of, I think last year it was three quarters, um, has been in the form of uh, mostly wind and solar renewable energy. 
stock of uh, electricity generation is still predominantly fossil fuel, but that is changing given the rapid change in the flow such that the IA predict that by 2025, renewables will overtake coal to become the largest source of electricity generation worldwide. So the way we generate our electricity is changing and it is changing fast. And really the era of fossil fuel power stations, those belching smokestacks which we're used to, is already behind us. Uh, that, that ship, if you like, metaphorically has already sailed. You've probably all heard of peak oil. Um, that was the story that, you know, we're just gonna start running out of the stuff. Um, well, we've actually reached peak fossil fuels in pretty much all countries, except for the ones that you see with kind of hatched bars there, uh, but not because we're running out of fossil fuels. There's plenty of fossil fuels in the ground, um, but we're actually demanding fewer of them. Uh, we are already seeing absolute decoupling in many countries um, from the use of fossil fuels. That's partly a function of the rise in renewables, as we've seen by the sort of the blue wedge here. Uh, which corresponds to an increasing portion of our global energy demand. But it's also a function of uh, much better energy efficiency, turning primary energy into final energy, into work done in a much more efficient way. Uh, and so the bit in the middle, the black bit, which is fossil fuels, is increasingly getting squeezed and is predicted to continue to be squeezed. Um, this is, just as a comic aside, this is the roof of the Kentucky Coal Museum. They venerate coal there, but they're not foolish enough to generate their energy from it. Um, and yet, and this is the crucial point, um, all of this rapid change that's happening in the electricity generation sector has mostly been uh, unpredicted by the likes of my community of econo economists and energy experts. Um, and I have here a chart from the International Energy Agency. I put this up not to pillory or lampoon, the agency, quite the reverse. I mean, these are a bunch of the most knowledgeable and authoritative people on the planet when it comes to predicting energy trends. And yet, uh, this chart shows their prediction of basically solar and wind capacity in electricity generation. And the big blue line that you see that kind of rises up sharply is actual outturns, actual capacity, actual deployment of renewables over the last couple of decades. What the little colored lines, the spidery lines that fan off to the right show is every year's World Energy Outlook prediction for deployment in the future. And what you find is that the IEA has been getting this wrong, but they've been systematically getting it wrong in one direction, i.e. they have underestimated renewable deployment time after time after time after time. And this has consequences because as I hope to show, the key driver of these cost reductions that we've seen in this sector has been deployment. As you deploy this stuff, you become uh, much more efficient at producing it, at installing it, at maintaining it, at transporting it. You also, uh, so that's learning by doing. Um, you also develop economies of scale in production, distribution, larger factories, lower unit cost per, uh, per item that's actually produced and distributed. You see these huge solar factories in China or gigafactories for uh, batteries. Um, they reduce unit cost quite substantially. Um, so uh, if you underpredict uh, deployment of renewables, you are likely to underpredict the cost reductions. Lo and behold, this is exactly what we've seen. And this is a sort of parallel chart that shows predictions of um, uh, cost reductions by the IAA and other key agencies and actual outturns, which have always been to the right of that. In other words, sorry, uh, sorry, predictions to the right and actual outturns, which are the dots, which have always been to the left of that. In other words, faster cost reductions than anyone could have predicted. Well, of course, um, if you under predict uh, deployment, you'll over predict price. Um, and, you know, this is a longer term chart. Uh, you know, it's really interesting to note here, the yellow line is solar PV. Um, since the first sort of satellites used solar PV commercial technology in the 1950s, the cost of solar PV has fallen by about 99.9% .9 per unit of energy output. Uh, the equivalent costs for coal have not fallen one iota. Um, sure, we're more efficient at burning coal, but actually coal uses a lot of expensive stuff in the form of labor, uh, which is required to dig it out, transport it, and then burn it, and labor costs have gone up more than proportionately. Um, so it's very clear uh, which uh, sector has a competitive uh, future. We're seeing a rapid transition here. Um, we're also seeing a rapid transition in, um, in other sectors as well, but you know, it's important to note that you only need to go back, uh, this is 2014, um, and, and you know this is this is a uh, 
a quote from The Economist in one of their leader articles, solar PV, they said then, is the most expensive way to reduce carbon emissions. Quite frankly, The Economist was pretty much behind the curve even then. I slightly squirmed when I read it. But the fact that they could kind of get away with such a statement with a sort of, you know, with a straight face is extraordinary. Um, considering uh, what has happened, you wind the clock forward to 2020, and the IA tells us that solar PV is the cheapest electricity in history. Uh, and, in, and that includes, as I say, a lot of the system costs associated with uh, accounting for intermittency. So, you know, you see the extent to which people have been caught by surprise. Um, we've seen a similar thing in electric vehicles, you know, 10 years ago, these were kind of eye-watering expensive luxuries for, um, you know, kind of rich people who can afford Teslas. Now it's very clear that all cars are going to go electric um, and that they will be cheaper, both in terms of performance, but also, and operating costs, but also uh, uh, purchase price um, as well. So these systemic changes um, are very easily uh, missed. People will groan and they'll say, yeah, but that's the easy bit, you know, uh, energy generation and, and cars. Well, they weren't saying that 10 years ago, quite frankly. And if you had said that, you'd have been escorted out of the room by security. Uh, and I will argue that there are many more of these kinds of transition, systemic cost transitions that are in the pipeline across a bunch of, uh, a bunch of sectors. It's not the first time uh, that we've seen these kinds of transitions, but the rate at which they will come is much faster. Why? Because we've got these reinforcing economic feedbacks that lead to tipping points. What do I mean by that? Well, we've talked about learning by doing and experience. We've talked about economies of scale and production distribution. What they tell you is that the more you deploy, the faster the costs come down. But of course, the faster the costs come down, the more uh, incentive you have to deploy. Uh, and so you get this reinforcing positive feedback. But it doesn't just stop there. There are network and coordination effects whereby you know the the the, the rate at which the advantage of moving in tandem with others um, increases um, the cost reductions. There are spillovers not just within the sector but outside the sector. Some colleagues of mine have done some great work showing that um, innovation in and patent citations from sectors in renewables are much higher than from. Um, fossil fuel sectors, partly because they're less mature. So it's not just the in-sector cost reductions, it's the productivity uh, spillovers to a lot of other sectors that boost economic performance. Uh, and then of course, you've got social and institutional feedbacks. They can happen quite quickly. Think of you know smoking in bars, smoking outside bars, wearing seat belts in cars and all the rest of it. Things that were thought unlikely to ever pass muster then become uh, social norms. And we're gonna see changes in acceptable standards of behavior increasingly relating to, um, to uh, 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 climate pollution. Um, and we're also going to see institutional change. We're gonna see new business lobbies and trade union lobbies. Um, it, you know, up till now, it's the incumbent business lobbies that have lobbied for the prevention of change because they're, they're the ones who can uh, access politicians more readily. That's always the case with change. But we're now getting some pretty strong um, business lobbies from the renewable sector as well, which are starting to kind of um, match um, that uh, political uh, influence. Uh, and then you've got changes um, in consumer uh, taste. Consumers routinely influence and follow one another. There are feedbacks and crowd effects, positive feedbacks. And so as we transition, um, it will become more acceptable and actually more popular that as uh, uh, in terms of consumer markets to demand that some of these goods and services are low carbon. And expect underlying all of this uh, reinforcing feedback is expectation, psychology, something that, again, economists sometimes struggle to model effectively in their, uh, in their assessments. And, but, it, but it's critically important. I mean, to, you know, uh, think, for example, if you're a business leader or a mayor or a, or a politician and you're thinking of investing in clean technologies and somebody tells you, no, climate change is a hoax, uh, and all these technologies are eye-wateringly expensive and the financing's niche and there's no growth market. How likely are you to invest in them? Answer, probably not at all. You'll wait uh, and you'll let others invest first. If you're told that in fact, the cost of these technologies are plummeting, the finance is becoming mainstream. And by the way, these are some of the fastest growing markets in the world. Moreover, if you don't move, your competitors will, and they'll start to sort of elbow you out of markets you're much more likely to, to try and invest. Now, bear in mind what I said before, the act of investment, the act of deployment is one of the things that drives down the costs. So if lots of people act the same way, then the costs indeed do come down. The, 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 the predictions to some extent become self-fulfilling. Um, so psychology can lead to this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that helps drive these tipping points and these transitions. 
I'm arguing that these transitions are much faster than in the past, but they're not unique. We've seen them before. This is a picture of Fifth Avenue in New York taken around the turn of the century. Uh, here is um, Fifth Avenue. Uh, some, sorry. <laughs> uh, can you see the car? Uh, the answer is there it is. Here's Fifth Avenue 15 years later or just uh, um, just under. Can you see the horse? Uh, uh, there it is. Now, that's a that's a huge transition. Um, obviously, if you'd asked an economist in 1900 to look at empirical evidence and make an assessment of how likely it is that we're all going to be driving cars, um, they'd say absolutely no chance. There's no evidence of anybody driving cars and the, and the costs are eye-wateringly expensive. Uh, they would have clearly got this wrong. And that's what we've been doing systematically when we forecast uh, renewable costs and renewable penetrations. And we just haven't accounted for the fact that you can have these tipping points whereby, of course, you know, you had to invest quite a lot in you know, uh, fuel infrastructure for combustion engines. Didn't come for free, a lot of money went into it, but nobody argues that it's less productive and less efficient as a means of transport than scaling up the horse and cart. Um, so that I think is a very kind of apt parallel. Um, that's a sort of bottom up example. Top down also matters. To give you an example of the psychology story, simplifying and paraphrasing a little bit, one of the reasons that the Copenhagen Agreement, which was some eight years before the Paris Agreement in 2015, failed where the Paris Agreement didn't, was because the Copenhagen Agreement was based, um, for the most part, on the narrative of burden sharing, on common but differential responsibilities, whereby all countries have to roll their sleeves up, uh, pay the sacrifice and do their bit for the common good and for the future of the global environment for our grandchildren. Turns out that that kind of moral suasion didn't get us very far because the incentives were there for people to free ride, uh, uh, make strong commitments, but wait for others to act first. The old tragedy of the commons that some of you might be familiar with. In Paris, the narrative was very much shifted from one of burden sharing to one of opportunity and self-interest. So the talk here was, look, you make a voluntary contribution to emissions reduction that is in your country's interest. It could be that you want to clean up your cities from particulate pollution. It could be that you want more efficient power generation and distribution. It could be that you want to tap the faster growing markets in solar uh, and in batteries like the Chinese did. It doesn't matter what the reason is. Uh, you go away, decide what you're going to do to reduce emissions, and then you can sell it to your electorate. And of course, then you generate a race to the top where countries try and compete to be first uh, and most successful uh, in making some of these transitions. And that's a much better way, it turns out, to breed global collaboration. Again, note the importance of expectations here. I mentioned um, pollution. I mean, I'll let you read this chart so that the joke can sink in. But the story of opportunity is a really important one. And, you know, I was um, uh, uh, the senior chief economist of something called the Global Commission for the Economy and Climate uh, or the New Climate Economy, uh, which tried to factor in some of these co-benefits over a five year period. In other words, short term benefits that politicians, business people care about. These aren't stories of grandchildren, um, their impacts you could have right now in terms of greater efficiency, which saves you money, in terms of reduced particulate pollution, um, something like 6% of global economic output um, is, a is, 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 there's a 6% of economic output equivalent impact um, from just one particulate, PM 2.5, according to a seminal study uh, by The Lancet. Um, that's quite, you know, it's around 4% in rich countries, in Asia, you know, Southeast Asia, China, Chinese cities, it's 10% plus, approaching 20% in some of those cities. Um, you know, it's a huge burden on health systems, on productivity, uh, and so forth. Congestion, um, 2 to 5% of GDP, according to the Asian Development Bank in, in developing Asia, is lost through people just whiling away hours sitting in traffic jams in Jakarta and Manila and Sao Paulo and elsewhere. Um, there's a whole bunch, and I won't go through them now, but there's a whole bunch of these co-benefits. And we concluded that between 50 and 90% of the path, or the, 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 the early path, to a two degree target could be met uh, at zero cost to GDP, indeed, uh, with some benefit to GDP. So this notion that you trade off uh, growth for environmental sustainability, even in the short run, even before you've looked at these huge innovation and efficiency changes that I've talked about um, at the beginning uh, is really quite high. Again, getting this message out increases the incentive to make the change that starts to generate those um, cost reductions that make the change much more palatable.
It requires investment. There's no doubt about that. Um, the climate change, the Committee on Climate Change uh, in the UK suggests that we're going to have to invest about a trillion in the UK alone over the next three decades, but that we'll save um, two trillion um, in, um, um, sorry, that's not the UK alone, um, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in savings um, at, at a global level. Um, and that's shown in this chart, what this chart basically shows, which is UK. And I'm sorry about this, sorry, the reason I'm slightly kind of swallowing my words is I don't know how it's coming out on your screen, but the labels are a bit garbled here. But what it basically shows is um, a, a bunch of sectors, both above the origin and below the origin, you know, the kind of sectors you'd expect, energy, generation, buildings, transport, the key uh, emission sectors. And what it shows is capital expenditure that's required to transition to net zero on the bars that are above the origin. And below the origin, it shows the efficiency savings in transitioning to this new uh, form of generating electricity and energy and industrial output. And of course, in the early years, you have to spend a lot of money rolling out the kit for very little gain. But with time, as the kit becomes predominant, the efficiency gains are such that your cost savings by around or before 2040, um, your net cost savings are greater than your cost. So you start saving money. So in the early years, yes, you have an investment cost associated with this transition, but in the later years at the whole economy level, uh, you are actually saving money. So again, it's not a question of, you know, do you go for green or do you go for growth? This is uh, the climate change committee numbers, but there are other studies that show this worldwide for businesses, this is important too, because it says, look, are you making the investment now to generate the opportunities associated with this uh, change in global markets? It's not just about you know, income flows and the income statements of any financial organization. It's about the balance sheet. Um, are you, have you invested in the right assets? And I don't just mean your, you know, your offices and your buildings and your production lines. I also mean your people, the skills of your workforce, but also your intangible assets, your processes and your ideas. Um, such that you are likely to be able to, you know, have a viable business model in 10 years if the global economy transitions as rapidly as some of these projections suggest it might. And if, and if you're not, uh, your shareholders will want to know about it um, because a lot of the assets that you are investing in may be left redundant and stranded or at least devalued. And you might just be elbowed out of whole new markets by competitors that are a bit more fleet of foot. Um, so we're seeing a lot of action now amongst shareholders and amongst regulators to ensure that firms across all sorts of sectors are resilient, not just to the impacts of climate change, um, but to what they call transition risk, this um, potential to be caught out by uh, extraordinarily rapidly changing uh, markets. And, and that's all for the good, because it means that you know, markets begin to price in um, the risk associated with, for example, conventional fossil fuel sectors, whereby in the past people used to price higher risk for clean technologies because they were new and exotic. Increasingly, uh, investors realize that they don't want to be saddled with um, polluting technologies. Um, and it's you know not only for commercial reasons, um, but it's also for litigation reasons. You know, increasingly, as uh, companies and individuals are seen to have acted in a way that compromises the livelihoods of millions of people on the planet, and they've done so knowingly because you know the climate science has been quite clear um, for the last few decades. They will be held to account in the courts, and they're not going to, of course, you know, those court cases won't always side with the litigants, but increasingly they will, and that's going to have a uh, an impact on share market valuations. You only have to look at things like PG and E or Monsanto Buyer to look at how quickly um, investors are spooked by the possibility of legal action, even before a, a particular case has been uh, won. So I will wrap up, as I often do, with a picture of a, of a greenhouse. Why a greenhouse? Well, it's a parable that I think starts to address the question, should we be optimistic? Because at this point in the presentation, many people um, will sort of ask, well, you, you seem very optimistic that we can do this at minimal cost. Um, that's great. Should we not worry about this? And that would be the wrong conclusion to draw, because one of the tragedies is that we haven't been making the changes over the last few decades that would have always yielded a bunch of the kinds of benefits that I've been talking about. Uh, and time is not something we have because every week, every month, every year that we waste, the stock of greenhouse gases uh, goes up and therefore the risks associated with climate change go up. So at this point, I tend to invoke Paul Romer, one of my favorite economists who won the uh, Nobel Prize for Economics in 2018. And what he does, I think very effectively, is he distinguishes 
complacent optimism from conditional optimism. Now, complacent optimism, uh, he says, is the feeling of a child waiting for presence. By contrast, conditional optimism is the feeling of a, of a child uh, who is thinking about building a tree house, hence the image, uh, and thinks, well, if I get some wood and some nails and persuades other kids on the block to help, we could end up having some fun and, and building something really cool. Um, now, the point here is that the treehouse didn't build itself. It took action um, to create it. And, and what he says is the theory of endogenous technical progress or endogenous growth, which is what he won his Nobel for, supports as conditional optimism, not complacent optimism. In other words, unless we actually take action to steer uh, the global economy in the right direction, to change our technological makeup, to change uh, consumer uh, behavior, we are not likely to meet this target. It will not happen if we just sort of expect the technologies to just appear as manna from heaven. So he says, instead of suggesting that we can relax because business choices don't matter, it suggests to the contrary, that policy choices are even more important than traditional theory suggests. So as scientists, I think what you'll understand here is that I'm talking about reinforcing feedbacks in uh, technological and economic structural change. Uh, and reinforcing feedbacks, as any scientist knows, are unstable and they're prone to path dependencies. And so the, the returns to making a choice, to investing in something early on, um, and, and steering that economy in the right direction are actually higher um, than in an economy that is mean reverting, that is subject to a unique equilibrium. That's a problem for economists because most of their models rely on there being a unique equilibrium. You know, these are models of the kind that say, what's it going to cost to decarbonize by 2050? Uh, well, let's assume uh, we know the cost of technologies, we know the structure of behaviors, we know what tastes and preferences are, and then let's just crank the handle. Well, hang on, um, you presuppose by assumption the things you're most interested in finding out. The point is that all those key variables are a function endogenously of um, the path that precedes them and the choices um, that are made. And that means that leadership matters, policy leadership and business, and business leadership uh, as well. In a sort of pithy concluding remark, I'll therefore say that rather than you know, economists and others spending a fruitless amount of time trying to predict the global economy in 2050, 2040 and beyond, uh, we should spend a heck of a lot more time uh, trying to design and steer that economy, working with those leaders and working with policymakers um, to make sure we have a regulatory and policy environment that is clear to businesses that can uh, then commit uh, private finance, because it is private finance that's going to make the change, it's not public finance, towards generating the economy I've been talking about, which um, not only being cleaner, quieter, uh, and more uh, sustainable and secure, will also turn out to be, uh, in many sectors, more efficient, more productive, and more innovative, innovative. And that will allow us to cover some of the costs of decarbonizing in sectors that don't have that kind of opportunity to generate innovation and cut costs. But either way, it certainly doesn't suggest that by 2050, the cost of decarbonization will have to be positive in terms of economic outcomes. I will stop there and uh, hopefully there's still um, time for questions. A huge amount to cover. So I'm sorry. Um, I hope you have kind of, you know, all had your coffees and haven't had your lunches yet. And uh, uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for that overview um, of the economics of the transition. Um, and I think that distinction between complacent um, and conditional optimism is a great uh, a great point. Um, and really puts the highlight on the need for, for action as you talked about. Um, so uh, we'll now move into the kind of Q&A session as you've just said. Um, so everyone, please do put your questions in the Q&A box. I can see that there's some coming up already. Um, so to kick us off, um, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation um, about the World Bank estimating that it would cost about 100 trillion in assets. Um, uh, to, to move forward with the transition. Um, has there much been much done on, on the cost of, of not moving to the transition, um, so if it's slow, um, if the action's slow? Um, and given your presentation, um, should we be changing the narrative from reaching net zero costing um, 100 trillion to instead representing a 100 trillion investment opportunity? Exactly right. And I, and I and I and that was the point. And thank you for picking up on it. That is indeed the point that needs to be made. Yes, you know, and look at the analogy of cars uh, and petrol stations and refineries and all the rest of it. There's a lot of infrastructure investment that needs to go into um, a structural change as large as the one we're talking about. 
Um, but that's investment money that, that yields returns. And it's also, um, you know, that investment has to take place anyway. So, you know, we did, I did a study with um, an outfit called Independent Economics, um, a chap called John Llewellyn. And, you know, we showed that if you actually worked with the investment cycle and simply replaced all capital equipment with the clean equivalent, um, you, would, you would pretty much get to net zero if you started doing it now. We're running out of time for that. And, you know, if we don't start now, we'll, we will eventually have to just sort of scrap capital before the end of its working life. Um, but the point here is that there's an awful lot of infrastructure investment that's going to have to take place anyway. What we kind of care about is how much of it is um, additional. Now, most estimates suggest that we're going to have to make sort of, you know, in, in terms of key energy and transport uh, at a global level is about five trillion dollars um, worth of investment that needs to be made every year uh, in clean technologies. But, you know, three or so trillion of that, maybe more, would have had to be made in 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 you know conventional um, polluting technology. So the addition uh, might be a, a trillion or two a year. That sounds a lot, but it's less than one percent of global output, and um, it's uh, investment. So it's it's investment that generates um, tangible returns. All investments. If you only look at investment, you'd never build another school or factory in your life. Um, because they don't give you much consumer pleasure in the short run, but they do um, in the long run. So, you know, understanding the difference between a resource cost and investment cost and understanding that, you know, even just to stand still, um, you know, you're going to have to invest in replacing equipment that, that you know, depreciates um, gives you a much better fix on the numbers even before you start to ask the real important question, which is, well, is that investment worthwhile in terms of generating returns or kind of should we be investing in something else? And what I'm arguing here is even before we said a thing about climate impacts, um, there is a really strong case for making this investment on a purely economic basis, um, which is kind of quite telling. Um, would have sounded kind of very unorthodox, indeed did sound unorthodox 10 years ago, is becoming increasingly mainstream now as we see kind of sector by sector making that change and making it in a, in a way that's um, uh, economically and commercially advantageous. Thank you, that's really useful. Um, I'll, I'll move on to the next attendee question. Um, you, you mentioned that you think private finance is, is kind of the key way um, to get through the transition. Um, so in terms of influencing corporate behaviour, what balance do you see between consumer choice and political influence through regulation? Should it be weighted in a particular direct direction to get to net zero? Um, this attendee says that they think that awareness and education are key to either. Awareness and education are really important. Perhaps more important, actually, for the preservation of natural capital more generally, you know, the present, present, uh, uh, preventing uh, ecological degradation. Um, but for both, and in particular for climate, I think um, policy is critical. Um, and the reason it's critical is that the big players in this, I mean, yes, you can try and persuade everybody to turn vegan and not drive their kids to school and uh, fly less on holiday, and that's great, some will. The problem is that you, know, you might end up with kind of cheaper meat, emptier roads, and cheaper airline flights for your neighbor who doesn't care so much about climate change to take two holidays a year and buy a second car and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the areas, the sectors we care about, energy generation, uh, buildings, transport, land, are really strongly policy-driven regulated sectors for good reason. Um, and so if you don't get the regulation and the policy in place, it's going to be very hard for the private sector to justify making the investment because the risk is too great. And it's not just getting the regulation of the policy in place, it's got to be credible and it's got to be, you know, likely to endure into the next government, because what the last thing you want is sort of, you know, flipping and flopping on policies. Um, so clear, credible policies with an institutional framework, in a way, in this, in, in, in this sense, the, the UK leads with its Climate Change Act and mandatory five-year rolling budgets and Committee on Climate Change uh, supervision and advice. Um, and even here, we're struggling to kind of make, you know, implement the deployment um, that's going to deliver net zero. But at least it's, it, you know, it's uh, it, it's very transparent because we've got the framework to kind of really point out the shortfall. Uh, we're, we're several steps ahead of many other countries. Um, so I think policy is critically important. But of course, policy is a function of consumer choice and a consumer choice is also a function of education and awareness. So I think ultimately, unless you have a common understanding of the problems and in, in this instance, some of the opportunities um, of making the change and 
a legitimate recognition by policymakers that transition is disruptive. And, you know, I know that sort of, you know, West Coast types think disruption is a great thing, but for most of us, it means we might lose our job or not be able to afford our energy bills. Um, so you need politicians to recognize that the losers are going to lobby hard against the change, even if the winners, you know, who tend to be more diffuse, they tend to be all of us outnumber um, the, the, the losers in terms of the net gains. Um, you've got to make sure that people are retooled and reskilled and able to take advantage of the opportunities of the new economy. If you don't, they're going to start, you know, taxi drivers will strike and people will start hurling petrol bombs on the street. You won't make progress. Uh, and I just as a sort of end note to this, you know, it's really you know, important to recognize that um, the real barriers to a net zero transition are not technological, they're not economic. They are political, they are behavioral, they are cultural. So if you don't tackle that head on, you're not going to make any progress in delivering the kind of economy we've been talking about. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, and you kind of touched on this in, in your answer just now, but of course your, your presentation focused on energy, um, but there are so many intersecting um, sectors which contribute to, to, to the environment and environmental danger zones. Do you see the same trends applying to, for instance, agriculture, which has different vulnerabilities um, creates different risks, but is essential to human well-being. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There are different sets. And of course, I didn't have time in, in half an hour to go through them all. Some are much more prone to technological fixes, which is great. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons why I, I distinguished, you know, environmental degradation and natural capital degradation from climate. You know, the latter is much harder. Um, you know, monetizing the gains of, in particular, um, you know, renewable natural capital, the kind of stuff that when it reaches thresholds can collapse irreversibly. So forests and fishery and biodiversity and all the rest of it is a lot harder. Um, but even in sectors like land use and agriculture, um, improving efficiency, improving the supply chains for food so that, you know, we don't end up with, I don't know, what is it, 40% of our food never hitting the fork uh, because it's been wasted on the way. Um, so there are fixes there to do with... Um, uh, digital technologies on supply lines. There's ways to make agriculture more efficient um, using, you know, land-based and uh, you know, terrestrial and, and, and air-based and, and, and satellite technologies. There's all sorts of ways that we can do things better, uh, but also we have to change our behavior. I mean, there's simply no way that everybody can carry on meeting, eating meat or meeting eat um, at the rate that we're doing um, and preserve, um, you know, we, we could probably still just about meet our carbon um, targets, um, but we wouldn't be able to preserve our natural environment in a way that yields all sorts of other risks, including risks um, to, uh, to, to, to climate change as well. So there are different stories for different sectors, you know, and some sectors will just have to be hard slog and will be more expensive and changes that people don't want. But the point is you can generate so many opportunities in other sectors, including things that are considered difficult, like steel making and cement and uh, aviation, uh, that you can sort of pay off um, some of the losses in those sectors and still deliver your, your climate outcome. Like I say, harder for natural capital, not least because we're not still on top of measuring what the hell is going on um, in, in, in that area. And we won't do unless you come back to that story of education and common understanding, where people care enough to say, look, we are living uh, beyond our means and we need to understand to what extent and, and how bad this problem is and what we do about it. And that's really useful. Thank you. Um, if you're happy, I'll try and squeeze in um, two more. Um, Please do. We finish. Um, so going back to the kind of energy focus, um, you mentioned you touched on um, solar and wind um, in your presentation. Um, but what's your opinion on nuclear power um, transitioning the energy grid away from fossil fuels in a way that doesn't drastically impact grid reliability? Um, this attendee thinks that requi that requires much greater nuclear investment. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'm not a nuclear expert, but clearly, um, you know, nuclear has certain advantages in terms of being um, zero carbon, uh, in terms of providing baseload electricity, uh, and, and so forth. Um, but it has attendant risks um, in terms of decommissioning, in terms of waste, in terms of um, in, in terms of global proliferation as well. So all of those are kind of broader questions that need to be assessed in the round. Um, the other problem, of course, with nuclear is because we haven't been rolling it out at the same speed that we did used to in the past, but at the same time, we're demanding tighter safety standards. The costs of nuclear have not fallen. They've actually tended, if anything, to rise. Um, so it's become a slightly less competitive technology. Now, there's all sorts of innovations um, in the pipeline, including you know, the sort of modular nuclear 
uh, which is more flexible, potentially safer, uh, and potentially more cost effective as well. So I, I don't have, partly because it's sort of outside my pay grade, I don't have underlying strong views on this. I see the utility of nuclear. I see the problems, um, but I th certainly think it should be in the mix. And I, I, I think it's certainly a sector that has uh, potential opportunities and value to add in this respect if we can do it right. Great, thank you. Um, and we'll just finish now um, on a final question. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your questions uh, to all of the attendees. Uh, we've had loads through, which is great. Um, so what role do you think professional institutions such as the IAS, which span societal sectors, what can we do to most effectively support um, and accelerate the necessary transition? Well, now here I can, I'm going to end on a slightly controversial note, because the tendency of a lot of um, environmental scientists, understandably, because they're on the front line of seeing how desperately dire the situation is, um, is to, to tell, well, two things. Um, scientists sometimes communicate um, horror stories in a way that make people disengage. Um, sometimes they communicate risk in a way that people don't understand, because there are lots of risks, but risk isn't a reason to do nothing. Actually, risk is a reason to really double up on your efforts, especially when some of those risks could potentially be irreversible and catastrophic. But people don't understand that because I say, oh, there's loads of risk. Ugh, these scientists, they haven't really understood. Um, well, of course, as scientists, we understand that risk is really what we need to focus on. Um, but let's not forget the stuff we're pretty confident about and how horrible that is, too. So there's a messaging story there. And then the third bit, which might be con more controversial, is obviously if, you know, if the world's in such a dire place um, that we have to kind of um, the only way to deal with it is to live in a hair shirt, then we just need to sort of bite the bullet and, and, and say that. But I'm not convinced that's necessarily the case. There has to be a lot of behavioral change and we're gonna to have to reduce our material uh, use dramatically. But we've never bothered to decarbonize in the past. Um, and so it's not surprising that the world has never decoupled its resource and pollution from output. The evidence suggests that in those cases where we've actually tried to make a difference, like energy, like cars and et cetera, the change could be quite dramatic. Now, of course, they are easier than some sectors, but I absolutely don't buy that. And, and like I said already, people didn't say that 10 years ago. And I'm sure there are a lot of other sectors and a lot of other tipping points um, that are due to take place. So to some extent, I think scientists also need to talk up a slightly optimistic side of the story, which is to say, look, it's in your interest to push for this change. Because frankly, if you scare people and they see this only as kind of, you know, um, the environment, which is something that's not necessarily um, the front of their mind if they're worried about their energy bills. Um, so therefore, they'll, they'll, they'll be seduced by the side that says, well, if you want your energy bills to come down, um, you should forget all the green crap. And that is toxic because that's what delays action and that's what you know imperils our future existence. So we need to be a little bit cleverer than just sort of saying, you know, you either kind of live in a hair shirt or, and look, you know, and, I, and that's not to be complacent. You know, we are gonna to have to make some changes that are gonna be painful, but we've got so many changes that we can start making, which will not be painful, that we really need to get on with them and not create such a toxic political environment that those parties that wanna delay that change for their own self-interest um, manage to do so. Oh, well, thank you so much, Dimitri, for your presentation. It, uh, it was really thought provoking and I think um, a lot of interesting food for thought um, for all the attendees today. So thank you very much for that. Um, and thanks, thanks to everyone that attended um, and for putting all the questions in. Um, I hope you found that as interesting as I did. Um, and don't forget, forget to record your attendance um, on the IES CPD tool, if you're a member. Um, and if you enjoyed this webinar today, um, we are holding uh, another webinar tomorrow. Um, this is on the controlled waters risk assessment, um, SOBRIS guidance, um, and you can register for that on our website. Um, so again, a massive thank you to you, Dimitri. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Cheers, Ethne. Thanks, everyone.